Early Bird Registration is now open for Fertility Awareness Mastery Live, and I know you'll love this program. Fertility Awareness Mastery is my eight-week group coaching program designed to help you gain confidence using fertility awareness. Whether you're actively avoiding pregnancy or looking to optimize your cycles for conception, we have a spot for you. We start the first week of May. Will you be joining us? Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash FAM, as in Fertility Awareness Mastery, F-A-M, to register today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash FAM. This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 308. Welcome to the Fertility Friday Podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I know, I'm a busy girl, but I managed to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with us today. I'm really excited to share today's episode with you. I have been thinking for the past couple of weeks about what I wanted to talk about. And I suppose, you know, what I came to makes perfect sense. Today, we we will be talking about stress and how stress affects the menstrual cycle. And in light of what's going on in the world, if you're listening to this in real time, you know, this is coming out in April 2020. And yikes, (laughs) what a doozy. The world is basically upside down, opposite, and yeah, very different to the world that I grew up in at this current moment. So if you're listening to this in the future, I distinctly hope that it's a very positive, amazing, wonderful situation that we're leading towards. So with that said, after careful thought, I decided that I would focus on stress and how stress can impact the menstrual cycle. Uh, If you're on my email newsletter, I sent out an email last week to my list. So if you're not on the list, head over to fertilityfriday.com slash freebies. And I've got all kinds of goodies. You can jump in and grab a freebie or multiple freebies, whatever you would like to have. There's free online courses, there's free eBooks and free chapter of the fifth vital science, there's all kinds of good stuff. And but I was sharing some of my reflections, and it made me think about what I wanted to talk about on today's podcast episode, because I did get some emails back and some just connection with a lot of you who were really just okay, great, I hadn't been thinking about my menstrual cycle and how charting could how I could utilize charting during this uncertain time when I'm going through all the stress. So let's talk about it. I think First things first, this is a conversation that I have with most of my clients, whether it's in the group program or or one-on-one programs. And so if you're a client of mine, you're probably laughing to yourself a little bit as we talk about this. But I just want to remind everybody that the purpose of charting, in my opinion, is it's not about perfection. It's not about crafting this perfect situation where your charts are always perfect. and, And it's just not about that. I always say that charting should fit into your life. It shouldn't be the other way around. So you shouldn't be trying to fit your, you know, whether they say like the square peg into the round hole or whatever. Charting is something that you should be able to incorporate into your life. And one of the uh, the things about charting, so especially coming from both my professional perspective, working in this field, but also from a personal perspective, having charted my cycles for two decades, is that with charting, if if this is the method that you've chosen to manage your fertility with, so if you're using it as a birth control method or to try to conceive, I always feel like you just have to roll with it. 
there's going to be times, for example, you know, like a week or, you know, if you have a really stressful situation happening, (laughs) for example, where it's not going to be perfect and you might miss a few days. And the, the most important thing, like I said, is not perfection. For my opinion, the most important thing is just if you're, if you're going through something, if something is challenging, then just do what you need to do to, if you need to take some time for yourself, if you need to relax and whatever you need to do, you know, take that time for yourself and then don't beat yourself up about it. If you miss a day of charting or a couple days of charting or checking or writing things down, just get on with it. As soon as you catch yourself and you start to feel better, the next time you go to the bathroom, just check, <laughs> just wipe and, and check. And, you know, when you wake up in the morning, just take your temperature, put your thermometer in a place where it's the first thing you have to touch when you get up in the morning and just get on with it. Don't worry and fret and beat yourself up. And certainly don't give up on the whole chart just because you missed a bunch of days. Even if you missed like two weeks, just get on, you know, get on with it, get going and don't beat yourself up about it. It happens, move on. The one thing I can say from the longevity just perspective is that you potentially have hundreds of charts in front of you. So if one isn't perfect, that's completely fine. The the wonderful thing about cycling is that, you know, once one cycle finishes, you always have another cycle to continue. I mean, I suppose always is not 100% accurate. I mean, eventually we'll stop cycling, but you know what I mean? I just wanted to start with that. So if you haven't been as on top of it, then, you know, give yourself a break and let this episode, let this conversation that we are having, one-sided conversation at this point, but let this just be your encouragement to next time you go to the bathroom, just start charting. And tomorrow morning when you wake up, take your temperature and just let's, let's just do this. Okay. So I wanted to talk about stress and the menstrual cycle. And I just want to take you through a couple of points. So I made myself a couple of notes to guide our conversation. And so when we're talking about stress, I think it's important to just make the distinction between acute stress and chronic stress. And it's, I think for a lot of us, it might seem pretty obvious, but these two different types of stressors can play out differently in the menstrual cycle. So acute stress is what we typically think of when we think of stress. So, you know, situational things, a really specific event, kind of a specific period of time. You know, if you have a really stressful week, if you've got a really big event or an occasion, if you've got travel, um, (laughs) as we're, if you're listening to this in real time, you know, the last couple of weeks have been stressful. So it's more acute stress is more of that situational piece where you can kind of really put your finger on a specific thing or event or period of time that has been stressful and that can affect your cycle in different ways. So when I'm talking about how stress can impact the menstrual cycle, I typically think of the menstrual cycle in two phases. So if we divide it in half air quotes, the first phase of the menstrual cycle, the pre-ovulatory phase, like if we just divide the cycle into two phases, that's the period of time before you ovulate. And then the second half of the cycle is, you know, the period of time between ovulation and when your period is coming. So if you're experiencing a specific stressor, an acute stressor, so whether it's a specific event or a period of time or kind of something you can really put your finger on before ovulation, then the most common way that that can affect your cycle is to actually delay ovulation. And so it doesn't always happen that way. So I know sometimes I'll we'll talk about stress in my programs and my clients will be like, okay, I've got a trip coming up. So kind of expecting to have this response. And it doesn't always happen that way because at the end of the day with fertility awareness, with charting, you don't control your body. Your body is doing what it's doing, but what you're doing is tracking it and understanding it and kind of, you're kind of in in a dance with it. But one of the most common ways that stress can affect the cycle when you're in that pre-ovulatory phase, so before you've actually ovulated, is that it can really delay that ovulation. So a couple of things that you just want to watch for if you're charting your cycles, if you're paying attention to your cervical fluid, then you really do want to make sure that you're confirming ovulation. It's certainly possible to have uh, more than one patch of cervical fluid. So in a situation where there's stress, you might notice that you have cervical fluid. It looks like you're going to ovulate. You're fully expecting it to happen, but then your temperature doesn't go up and then you see mucus again. So that's called the double peak where you actually see mucus and then maybe it doesn't lead to ovulation and then you see it again. And so when you're, whether you're avoiding pregnancy or trying, you want to be aware that that's a possibility and you do want to, whatever 
first of all, you got to, if you're using the method to avoid pregnancy, you got to choose a method. <laughs> so pick one, really learn the rules, understand how to confirm ovulation. And if you're using a version of the symptothermal method, so, you know, temperature and mucus, you're going to want to learn how to cross check those two signs and just verify that. And in a case where you where ovulation is delayed, like I said, you can have more than one mucus patch, or you can just have a, a kind of a quite a long delay until you start seeing mucus at all. So I'll be interested to to see if this is once I release this episode and we we chat about it and you comment on it, if this is something that you've experienced over the past little while. And so if we switch then and talk about the post ovulatory phase, so after ovulation has already happened, if you happen to experience an acute stressor during the second half of your cycle, it would affect your cycle dif- differently. If you've already ovulated, well, things are already in motion here. But what can happen is certain stressors can shorten the luteal phase, can increase or cause premenstrual bleeding, is essentially a result of a sharp drop in progesterone earlier in the cycle than you would expect. And so that could also coincide with increased PMS symptoms and kind of just that feeling of imbalance, like that imbalance of your hormones. And so if you happen to experience an acute stressor in the post-ovulatory phase, then those are some of the signs to watch for. So I think it's helpful to talk a little bit more specifically about stress, because when we think about stress, we tend to think of negative events. So, you know, traffic, job that I don't like, stressful situation in the relationship, fight with partner, something emotional. But stress can be a lot of different things. It can also include happy events. We mentioned, I already mentioned things like travel or if someone's getting married or if you're planning a huge birthday party to celebrate somebody's, you know, whatever birthday. There can be things that we identify as positive that can actually be stressors. But now that we've talked about some of the acute stressors, I think it's also helpful to touch on some chronic stressors because some of the chronic stressors that can negatively impact the menstrual cycle aren't necessarily as obvious and don't necessarily come to mind when we think about stress. So chronic stress can be induced through things like diet. If you're really eating a high processed foods or high sugar diet, that can cause inflammation, which is basically a type of chronic stress. If you think about stress from a hormonal perspective, cortisol is a stress hormone and what certain, what things can increase that in your body, right? And so in addition to, you know, eating inflammatory foods or or certain things that can affect you, if you have certain food sensitivities or allergies and you're regularly consuming those types of foods, those can again cause an inflammatory response that is stressful in the body. If you have chronic in- infections that you don't you're not even aware of that are or underlying infections that you're not aware of and your body is fighting those off, again can contribute to an inflammatory response, a, a triggered immune response. And so these are things that you wouldn't necessarily think of necessarily as stressors, but could certainly be fully present and having a negative impact on your cycle. So of course, this is outside of the kind of current situation paradigm, but it's it's um, it's something to be attuned to. So in addition to that, I mean, emotional stress, depression, loneliness, excessive worrying, feeling afraid, feeling helpless or hopeless. So those types of feelings, um, especially over the long term consistently, can certainly contribute to stress. And the basic things like lack of sleep, not eating enough food, and I should mention even exercise can be a stressor to the body. I mentioned how stress can impact the second half of your cycle if you have an, a specific event, can shorten your luteal phase. And so excessive exercise, if you're not fueling, if you're not consuming enough to offset that, can certainly contribute to that as well. And so can hunger in times of stress. It's easy not to eat (laughs) and to forget to eat. I am certainly guilty of that sometimes. And it's important to be aware of those things. And what I've always said throughout the years, especially for those of you who listened to the podcast for a while, is that one of the things that I found in my life and also for my clients over the years is that charting can prevent you from going totally off the rails. (laughs) And what I mean by that is that If you have a really stressful situation, or even if you have a health issue that is causing your body to experience some of those chronic stressors that we talked about, when you're charting your cycles, especially, you know, the more charts that you have under your belt, 
And if you did have a fairly, you know, if you're working towards improving your cycle and you were getting your hormones in balance and everything was starting to look great, and then something happens and it kind of throws you for a loop and all of a sudden your cycles kind of start to look different and you start to see some of the effects from not really following all of the things you were wanting to or the effects of stress. One of the things that I found is that it can really help you to stay on track. Once you have a cycle or two that kind of goes to the wayside, some of the symptoms that you were so successfully managing and on top of start creeping back. You have kind of like a super high PMS cycle where, you know, a lot of those symptoms had resolved. You've got a ton of pain, one cycle where when you have your period and that's something that you had previously addressed. When you're charting your cycle, when you're paying attention and you start to see that your actions and your self-care and how attentive you are to some of these things, when you start to see that those choices that you make can have such a significant impact on your quality of life and your cycle, then it's often just a a really great tool to keep you in line, to keep you balanced. And so I always say it, it kind of, it has the potential to keep you from ever really going off the rails because you can actually see that, wow, I have the power to improve things and change things. So again, I want to stress how I started the episode at the very beginning. Again, this isn't about perfection. And if you do have a cycle that's totally off the rails in a time of stress, it's not an opportunity to beat yourself up about it and act like you did something wrong. It's a good opportunity to reflect on the fact that we're human beings and that our lives are in constant motion and our cycles are just simply reflecting back what's happening. So for example, if your past cycle was kind of off, I would encourage you to take it out and look at it. If you take notes during your cycle, so that's something I really encourage my clients to do, to really just take notes of things that are happening, note if there was any big events or if you had any heavy emotions or if if certain things took place. So that when you're looking over the cycle and you're trying to analyze it and, and really figure out what was going on, that you have that information. You know, one of the things that that I find myself doing and and one of the ways that I support and guide all of the women that I work with is to really help reflect on some of those things. Because often we're in a situation where you look at your cycle and it's just like, wow, I don't even know what was going on here. Ovulation happened super early or ovulation happened super late. My mucus patterns were all over the place. What was going on with my luteal phase? I never have spotting before my period. What, you know, what happened this time? It doesn't even look like I ovulated this cycle, but why was I bleeding? You know, whatever the case is, when we're looking at that together, I'll often find myself asking questions, you know, what was going on and what was happening and was that, did anything happen on this day? And well, your temperature was kind of wonky on this day. And as we go through it together and as I ask questions, we typically put a picture together. To be honest with you, I haven't, I can't think of a time when I've worked with someone who had a cycle that was off and in a, in a very specific way that was different to how it usually is where nothing at all happened. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's really funny how we can re- forget what, what has taken place. I can't tell you how many times that we go through and it's like, oh yeah, you know, there was this huge thing that happened at work this, that week. It was really, really stressful or, you know, I never really thought about it, but yeah, I guess I was kind of sick for <laughs> that, that week or yeah, that was totally around the time that I was traveling and I didn't think it affected me that much, but now that I'm looking at it, So understanding how stress can impact the cycle, understanding how important it is to keep good notes and and really taking the time to go back and analyze any cycle abnormalities and really asking those questions for yourself, like what was going on? Um, Did anything change? Was there anything happening in my personal relationships? Was there anything that was happening with my job? Was there anything that was happening in the world? And what was happening around the time where I'm noticing those changes? Just by going through some of those questions and kind of making your own notes and potentially journaling about it or whatever the case, that can really help you to interpret your charts. And as I mentioned, it can allow you to be kind to yourself. And I think we have certainly an attachment to perfection in in our culture. We want everything to be just so. We want it to be picture perfect. We want everything to be really easy and we want it right away. And with charting, it's it's not 
it's not any of those things. Uh, the experience of charting and developing mastery and feeling comfortable and confident, it's something that it doesn't happen right away. It happens after you actually chart your cycles for a minimum of three to six months. But what you'll, and you know, you can certainly get the hang of it and understand it. But when you stick with it and you continue to chart over a period of, you know, a year, two years, five years, 10 years, you gain insights from that consistent habit of charting that you couldn't possibly gain from a book and that you wouldn't gain from just a, a couple of a cycle or two. And so I encourage you to stick with it, to remember that your cycle is always reflecting back to you what's going on in your health, whether it's immediately in the case of stressors like this that we're talking about, whether it's health wise or, you know, whatever the case is. And so when you have a cycle that doesn't conform to what you expect, it, it doesn't mean it's a failure. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It, it just means that this is a reflection of what was happening. So I hope that you take that to heart if, if your cycle was kind of wonky. And on the flip side, maybe your cycle isn't wonky at all. Maybe you expected that because of all the stress that's happening globally, that there would be something changing in your cycle. And maybe there wasn't. And so that's okay too. And sometimes it's helpful to reflect on all the things that you're doing right. It's so easy for us to really focus on everything we're doing wrong. Oh, I ate that thing and I, you know, I didn't go to bed early and I binge watched the show and blah, 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 whatever the case is. And so I think it's really helpful to remember all the things that you're doing right, all the things that you have been and continue to be doing to support your cycles and your health. And and maybe if you're if you notice that your cycle hasn't really changed a lot, it just means that it's confirmation that what you've been doing has been working. Hey, I just wanted to jump into today's episode and invite you to join us in the next round of Fertility Awareness Mastery Live. Now, I have, similar to most of you, if you're listening in real time, been really thinking about, you know, should I offer the course? Should I not? But the consistent message that I've had from my clients that I'm working with and the members of my most recent group program is that many of us are ready to talk about something else and to focus on what's really important. And so we still have spots available for you. We would love to have you join us in May. Make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam, F-A-M, for details and to join us. That's fertilityfriday.com slash fam. Now, without further ado, let's jump back into today's episode. So everybody manages stress differently. And certainly, you know, what I'll share here isn't necessarily new information for a lot of you. But I do think that it is helpful to have a reminder every now and then. And that's something that has consistently been reminded to me. Even I need to to have a reminder sometimes. And sometimes it's really, especially actually at times when there's a lot of stress going on and a lot of uncertainty, it's really important to go back to the basics. So when you think of stress from a hormonal perspective, what we're often trying to do is balance out our hormones. Cortisol is a great hormone when you make it at the right time. Melatonin is also a great hormone. And cortisol and melatonin have a bit of a dance going on. So in the daytime, when the sun is out, that is when our cortisol levels should be highest. And at nighttime, when we're fast asleep, that is when our melatonin levels should be lowest. So these hormones are kind of in opposition to each other, not in a bad way. And so to encourage your hormone production during the time that it should be happening, you want to really try to do what you can to encourage your cortisol production for when you wake up. So getting good sleep and managing your hormones and your stress can actually start when you wake up in the morning. What I mean by that is when you wake up in the morning, if at all possible, it's good to get some sunlight and some fresh air. So if you have the ability to go outside, have expose your your eyes to the sunlight, to stimulate that cortisol production, to open a window, Uh, to look outside, to go for a walk, whatever the case is, it's a really good option to stimulate that natural cortisol production so that you're having your natural energy boost and also setting your circadian rhythm. So that's something to think about. This also helps to set you up for good sleep. Uh, Once you get into the habit of exposing yourself to the sun first thing in the morning, it does set that circadian rhythm and you might find that you're actually feeling ready to, to go to sleep at bedtime. 
the following night. One of the things that's really important is to optimize your sleep. If you're, if stress is, is becoming an issue for you, uh, it's good to kind of go back to those basics, try to get to bed early. So ideally before 10 o'clock or before nine o'clock, if you're able to, before 11 o'clock at the latest, if you're able to again, and try to optimize your sleep environment. So especially when you're looking to support hormone production, to support your progesterone production in the luteal phase, and just generally balance hormones, support your melatonin production at night. You want to sleep in the dark. You want it to be really, really dark. I'll list a couple episodes below if uh, this is a new concept for you, something we've been talking about on the show for a long time. But you want to sleep in the dark. You want to try to minimize your light exposure in the evenings so that you can really support your melatonin production and get a really great sleep. One of the things you can do to support your progesterone production and to encourage a really great night's sleep is to consider doing a bath before bed and making sure to throw in some Epsom salt, throw in some lavender essential oils or anything that's really going to relax you. Magnesium, Epsom salt, so is a magnesium sulfite and magnesium is known to relax the body and relax the muscles and especially help you to have a really good solid sleep. So certainly something to try, especially if you've been in a uh, experiencing stress, whether it's chronic or acute, one of the ways to lower inflammation in the body, but also to help to relax your muscles and to relax you in general, to calm the nervous system and to help you get more sound sleep. So, I mean, there's tons of other ways that you can uh, reduce your stress and it, it's really individual. It really depends on what works for you. So what works for one woman might not work for another, but you may want to consider some sort of practice, whether it's yoga, whether it's exercise, whether it's walking in nature, whether it's spending some time with a friend, whether that's virtually or in person. But you want to think about things that you can do that make you feel good, make you feel happy, joy, laughter, whether that's uh, putting on your favorite song and dancing to it in the mornings when you get out of bed or if you you're feeling if you're feeling a bit low have a couple songs at the ready that you can dance to that that always put you in a good mood what activities did you like to do a lot of us forget or stop doing some of the things that used to make us happy when we were kids so whether that's journaling writing writing stories like writing creative uh, doing creative writing writing fiction stories whether it's playing an instrument did you play the piano when you were growing up did you play uh, the guitar or something like that did you like to sing what is it that you used to do that bring you brings you joy did you like to draw did you like to paint when we're feeling stressed out, it's helpful to think about what are some of the things that can make us feel happy and to reconnect with things that bring us joy. It's hard to talk about stress without talking about developing a meditation practice or having some sort of way to reflect, whether it's through prayer, through meditation, through journaling, whatever it is. And again, everyone is different in how they're going to manage stress, but there's so much science behind meditation in terms of its ability to reduce stress, reduce cortisol, even change the brain and to help us to really relax and to maintain a state of calm, even under pressure, even when things are going haywire around us. So certainly worth thinking about if you, whether if you have never considered a meditation practice before, it's certainly worth thinking about as one of the, the possible options for managing stress. In terms of the current situation that we're in, where many of us are basically in our homes and we don't really have a lot of options in terms of where to go. A lot of the things that you might have done previously to reduce stress may no longer be an option to you. So for example, um, one of our favorite activities to do as a family is to go swimming and that is not something that we are able to do anymore. And so for the current situation, a couple specific examples that I found to be helpful that many of you may find to be helpful as well is to either limit or completely eliminate the media. So if you find that you are feeling anxious or nervous or fearful, uh, hopeless, and you're, you are watching the regular media on a day-to-day -day basis, it is worth considering doing a media fast, taking some, you know, doing a little bit of journaling. So writing down how you're feeling and how many times a day or how many hours a day you're consuming of the, the media and take, do a fast, you know, go a day, two days, a week, two weeks, 
uh, with no media at all or consider limiting how much media you're watching in a day. And then again, take out the journal and take a just note, write it in your chart, make a note of how you feel, if it makes a difference for you and think about, you know, how you would use that time. So this extra time that you have. But for some of us, it's, it, it makes a huge difference if what you're really wanting is to reduce stress, to reduce the fear and anxiety, and you're really wanting to feel more peaceful and calm, then certainly a good idea to at least try limiting or eliminating the, your exposure to media. If you do decide to go ahead and reduce or eliminate some of that media time, then I mean, what does it leave? Uh, one of the activities that you may or may not be looking to incorporate during a stressful time is reading and paying attention to the types of books that you're reading, especially if you're trying to maintain a state of calm, you know, what's going to calm you, what's peaceful, what's, what's going to make you laugh, what's going to make you feel joyful. And, and so there's certainly some degree of opportunity in all this. I've seen a number of memes floating around here and there that are saying, all those times that I wished I had time to do things, now I have time and I'm not doing things. I think that it's it's an interesting reflection, but I think that there, for many of us who've been on this just crazy treadmill of life and haven't had much of a time to slow down, um, of course, it would have been nice to have under different circumstances. But for many of us, this is the first time that we've been forced to sit down and relax and reflect and just kind of be with ourselves. And it's okay not to be super productive. It's okay to sit with the uncertainty and try to make sense of it because that in of itself is extremely productive, even though it's not productive by our kind of patriarchal standards. So I think for many of us, this has been a time to, to really turn within and to reconnect with ourselves, with what's important to us. And so with that, I just want to do a quick recap of what we talked about in today's episode. So to bring it back to stress and how stress can impact the menstrual cycle, we talked about acute stress versus chronic stress and the different ways that that can impact the menstrual cycle. We talked about how stress can impact the cycle in the pre-ovulatory phase versus the post-ovulatory phase. And we did talk about some of the practical strategies that we can use to manage stress. So from, and a lot of it when it comes to stress is lifestyle and really going back to the basics, uh, especially in times of really intense stress or really intense situations, going back to the basics, making sure that we're eating enough, we're getting good sleep, we stay hydrated, we um, take good care of ourselves, and we really kind of go back to some of those basic tenets, basic things that bring us joy. I think it's really important. And managing what we're allowing to become into our environment. So managing our media time. So whether that's television, whether that's social media, really thinking about if you're looking to reduce stress and you're looking to kind of calm keep yourself in a state of calm, really managing what you're allowing into your world can be super helpful. So I want to hear from you. I want to hear how you have been managing during this time. What has really worked for you uh, to manage your stress? What did I leave out? What are some of the just the, the different practices that you've been doing to help you maintain during this time? So we'll be talking about this episode in the Facebook group fertilityfriday.com slash community. So I look forward to hearing from you in there. And you'll also find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 308. So in the show notes page, I'll make sure to link past episodes where we've talked about stress, where we've talked about the HPA access, and just how different ways to manage stress. So I've done a number of episodes uh, that talk about meditation and that talk about a number of different ways to manage stress so that we can really optimize our cycles and maintain hormonal balance and of course feel good because it feels a lot better when we're not living under, under a constant state of stress. So with that, I want to thank you for tuning into the show today, for joining me for this important conversation and I do hope that you and your families are coping and doing well 
and I suppose just doing your best. I think we're all doing our best during this time to keep our spirits up and to move from a state of fear to a place of peace and love. So that's what I will leave you with today. Thank you so much for being a part of the Fertility Friday community. Please share this episode if you know someone who could really appreciate and benefit from hearing it. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.